So uh, if you have the little control panel up on your right and you press the red arrow, up will come a, a control panel that allows you to type in a question. And Joe will take time at the end of his presentation to answer those questions for 15 or so minutes. So um, if it occurs to you during the presentation, you can type it in, and Joe will be collecting a list of those questions. So thanks, Joe, very much. You're always um, generous with your time and uh, help to all of us. Great. Thanks, Mary. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started here. Uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, tuning in. Um, you do not need to take uh, copious notes because we'll uh, record this and uh, provide the slides as well as a YouTube uh, podcast of uh, the presentation. Uh, so as Mary mentioned, um, I was asked to talk to you today about what can Beaver teach us about uh, adapting to climate change and building more resilient systems. And this is a uh, obviously a pretty uh, topical um, uh, topic these days. And um, before we kind of get into the details of that, if you haven't uh, used GoToWebinar before, um, the, like Mary mentioned, you've got this little screen up on your, uh, on your page there. Um, you're automatically muted, so you don't have to worry about um, everybody hearing your conversation. Uh, you can raise your hand. I probably won't catch those until the end. Um, and the best thing to do is just tap, uh, type in questions as they come up, and then we'll try to go through those uh, at the end. Um, so let's get started here. Uh, with this audience, I did have a quick look through um, who uh, most is most of the people that had signed up, and uh, I do feel very much like I'm going to be preaching to the choir here, um, or the already converted. Um, most of you are probably already convinced about the merits of using Beaver as what I like to call a cheap and cheerful restoration tool, and I think a lot of you know the basic story behind uh, Beaver and their dam building activity. Um, we've given a number of webinars. Uh, some of these I'll provide links to as well. There's some others that. Uh, cover different aspects of this story um, and I'm sure a, a number of you have even heard my spiel before um, but uh, today I'm going to try and uh, focus on this climate change um, and the adaptations to it question and we'll start out with everything you need to know um, about beaver that you probably already learned um, when you were six or seven years old um, or at least six uh, and seven year olds today are learning this as the popularity of beaver um, grows and grows. Um, then I want to talk about um, sort of the obvious backstory with climate change and uh, some of the latest uh, data on that um, and point out that beaver have been here before um, in terms of having to deal with big uh, big problems and big changes and uh, being resilient and adaptable. Um, and I'll argue that it's time to move a bit past uh, the nostalgia that we often have in conservation um, efforts um, and look for the battles that we can fight and win as things are changing so quickly and talk specifically about where are those battlegrounds where um, using beaver as a restoration agent and conservation tool uh, might uh, provide us the most benefits. So there's a number of uh, great new uh, resources and uh, a lot of press coverage. There's some new documentaries. You can go watch Leave It to Beavers, uh, the PBS documentary on Netflix. There's lots of great websites and resources out there. Um, uh, there, some of these folks I, I believe might be on the um, on the webinar today and we may hear from them in the question section. Um, there's a lot of places that you can go um, to learn the basic story and um, and that's a story of beaver having uh, historically much much larger populations than we do today. Um, so estimates anywhere from 60 to 400 million um, historically and current estimates and this is is sorely in need of uh, a revisit, but uh, at least orders of magnitude uh, less. And uh, the main cause for that is because of a fashion and status symbol in uh, in Europe, uh, the top hat and other uh, fur-related uh, products, and so they were trapped nearly to their extinction in the late 1800s. Um, but their spatial distribution today, um, even though they were uh, extirpated in some areas, um, essentially still um, spans its whole historic spatial range. We know that this is uh, an underestimate, and I'll talk a little bit about that as we go forward. Um, 
Right. So um, Beaver obviously or, um, are uh, organized uh, around a, a colony, a family unit. Tends to um, consist of somewhere between you know four and eight individuals. Uh, every year, um, a mating pair um, tends to have two to five kits. Those kits stay around for a bit, uh, a couple years, um, which is quite long uh, for, for mammals, and then disperse, and uh, they may try and go and, uh, and make a living on their own. They are a habitat generalist that is highly adaptable. Um, we find them in lakes, rivers, and streams, abandoned channels and floodplains, wetlands. We find them up north in arboreal forests. Um, we find them down south in, um, in, in dry deserts. Um, this is um, a rodent that can even occupy estuaries. Uh, it's not that uh, concerned about uh, water quality, and brackish water is certainly not a deterrent. We find them at the mouths of glaciers, and so habitat generalist is a good term. I like to think of them as an undiscriminating rodent. Um, this is a rodent that, this is a, again an outdated range map, but basically the, the range sort of uh, tapers off in the north um, where we hit tundra and they get a wood limitation, and then the south where there's maybe a combination of water and or wood limitations. Um, one of the things that we're most interested um, in beaver for is their dam building activity, this, uh, this activity that makes them this amazing ecosystem engineer. And so the reason it's important to remind ourselves why they build these dams is they can survive in a huge uh, range of, uh, of aquatic environments, but when the water is not deep enough that they can't maintain an underwater entrance to their lodge, they manipulate that environment through building dams to raise those water levels. Also in areas where you might have winter freeze the um, uh, and you might have ice cover, having a deeper um, water keeps it from freezing all the way through and it allows them to have easy access, for example, to a food cache that they may have built up with a bunch of uh, woody material um, in the fall and that uh, allows them to survive through uh, the winter. In the spring and summer, they um, they harvest a, a whole variety of herbaceous plants, um, forbs, grasses, grain, row crops if they're around, um, and uh, they can eat just about anything. They do need to um, be chewing regularly and gnawing um, on their incisors, which continually grow, um, but their diet um, in the summer may be as much as 85% um, of uh, just a... a uh, uh, these regular veg vegetation as opposed to woody plants. Uh, sorry there. Um, so in the whereas in the fall and the winter they tend to harvest this material and then they're using that material to uh, then uh, eat the cambium off the, of the bark and they can uh, bury those um, woody uh, plants. They can bury the branches in the bottom of a pond and they do that in, um, in a food cache and so they then have access to that uh, through the winter even if there's ice cover. <laughs> Um, beaver do behave a bit like rotational crop farmers. Um, they tend to work areas uh, really hard uh, as shown here and they have a forage range that's up to oh, about uh, 100 meters away from uh, the water's edge where the risk of being um, eaten by some predator um, is offset by the opportunity to um, get uh, aspen and uh, other woody material that they want to use for dam building uh, and for food. And they tend to hit these areas hard and then they let them lay fallow for a while um, and they recover and a lot of species, particularly aspen, a lot of riparian species are very well adapted to this disturbance and grow back uh, very, very vigorously. Uh, so here's this uh, aerial view of that same spot and you can see the skid trails that they have working up into uh, this, this aspen and just how far they're willing to go for something as tasty to them as aspen. You can also see this just amazing series of dam complexes uh, which are so common and so they often build a, a very large dam with their central lodge. You can see this big pile here is their central lodge. This one is massive. It's like two stories. Um, and then they have a whole series of secondary ponds and those secondary Secondary ponds allow them to extend their foraging range um, and uh, easily uh, gr harvest uh, additional materials. Uh, we've already talked a bit about their lodges. 
um, as well. So most of that is a review for, for I think most of you on, on the line, but it's just good to make sure that we're, we're on the same page there. Now, um, if we take a little tangent into talking about climate change and all the impending doom and uh, bad news, or maybe some new opportunities, our climate future, um, we've, we've all heard this. There's big uh, projected changes in precipitation um, and changes in temperature, uh, exactly what happens very closely linked to various emission um, scenarios and how that unfolds. Uh, most recently, uh, this 2014 uh, U.S. National Climate Assessment has just uh, come out and provided updates on all these things. Um, there's some, some great new information, but it's still the same story. Big, big impacts, uh, particularly uh, with regards to water supply. Even if we assume there won't be any climate change, which uh, anybody that believes that at this point, well, you're probably not on the call. Um, but even if we do believe that, um, w we've got a lot of areas um, in the United States that are very... Um, very susceptible to, um, by 2050, major, major impacts on their water supply systems. Um, if you look at examples from this, uh, this 2014 report, uh, here's projected snow water equivalent um, over the next uh, few periods. So this is uh, basically currently and then um, on out to 2041 to 2070, 2070 to 2099. And these are the projected snow water equivalent declines um, of southwestern states. And so uh, big predictions in the west of reduced snowpacks, reduced stream flows, increased wildfire. Uh, etc. And so with um, the realization that uh, as much as we may try to pretend this is um, a reality that we're going to have to face, adaptation is becoming increasingly emphasized. Um, uh, and this is, I think, a really important shift um, in policy um, under the Obama administration. So we've got things like this report that just came out that have, a, uh, have whole sections talking about adaptations and how we prepare to adjust for these new conditions. Um, and reducing the harm and taking advantage of new opportunities that may exist. There's a, there's a whole working group of a, a number of federal agencies and state agencies working um, on the National Fish, Wildlife, and Plants Climate Adaptation Strategy. Uh, bumper stickers like this may be a little extreme, but um, it's good to see adaptation being um, a major part of the discussion as opposed to holding the line and pretending that, uh, that we can prevent things from changing. Um, Josh Lawler, a few years back, wrote a great uh, article, uh, sort of review and sort of um, uh, policy article on climate change adaptation strat strategies and how we might employ them. And he really advocates moving towards more agile management, not being so stuck in our ways. We're going to need to, if we're going to respond to um, threats and opportunities, we need to be more agile. And in doing so, shift our restoration focus from this historic species assemblage to, you know, to the potential future ecosystem services and the ones that we stand the, um, the best chances of being able to save. Um, and part of this, we really need to understand which species are most affected. Um, so beaver, um, when it comes to uh, big um, gloom and doom and uh, big, big changes, beaver have been here before. Beaver have been around for quite some time, so um, at least dam building beaver, um, at least over the Pleistocene um, and, uh, and through... Um, <laughs> up until the present and you know there's been wood chewing varieties but you know we have at least sort of uh, a million years of beaver um, having built dams and having gone through major fluctuations in climate um, that they've weathered those ups and downs um, they were also pushed uh, to the brink of extinction um, and nearly extirpated and have come back in both North America and Europe different species but um, but uh, similar stories. Um, and then here, um, they've also been shown that their systems um, that they build, their dam complexes, can mitigate the impacts of droughts. Um, and so this can be very good for maintaining wetlands. It can be very good for streams that may otherwise uh, uh, run dry um, seasonally and uh, turn intermittent and maintaining perennial flow. Uh, there's a number of papers um, that uh, sort of anecdotally describe this, a few that document it, and lots of anecdotes out there. Um, they've also been used uh, successfully for some time now in both restoration and conservation efforts. 
Um, one of the things that I always try to remind people of um, is that uh, when we're talking about this and getting all excited about it, it's just not new to think of Beaver as a restoration agent. Um, yes, they are a potentially cheap um, alternative and cheerful if it works. Um, that makes sense because the scope of problems we place, we face in our rivers, streams, wetlands are um, enormous and we don't have endless budgets. Um, but this uh, rodent example is not new. Um, so this is, uh, some of, a bunch of you will have seen this already, but this is uh, an example from Idaho Department of Fish and Game in the late 40s, early 50s, post-World War II. Uh, folks came back with... Uh, apparently some good paratrooper skills and uh, thought well hey what can we do with these um, these beaver let's uh, let's put them in a box strap a parachute to them and see if uh, we can parachute them into backcountry areas where we'd like um, their help building dams to create trout habitat and fight floods that was the the logic and they were taking those beaver uh, from nuisance beavers down in areas that were irrigated and they're clogging canals and and whatnot so um, so this is is an idea that's been around for quite some time. Its popularity is clearly growing um, uh, a lot um, in recent years. Uh, uh, there's there's lots of uh, radio interviews and uh, occasional TV spots, um, mainstream media picking up things, uh, unlikely partners in some ways. Um, with uh, with with ranchers who we may have um, of presumed that they wouldn't ever want beaver, and lots of them want them back on their uh, on their ranches for precisely the reasons we're talking about and trying to uh, maintain water uh, through uh, dry summers and and drought periods. So um, there's there's some interesting when we think about climate change, just some interesting work that's been done um, a few years back now by uh, Jerema and others uh, looking at forecasting beaver abundance and this is up in uh, Quebec and they were forecasting how their abundance might change uh, with uh, predicted climate change and they're they're suggesting that we may see an increase in the abundance of, of uh, beaver and that a lot of the uh, sort of climate change uh, impact work that's looked at how different biota may respond often results in big shifts in the range map. And they say there might be minor shifts in this range map. But if you think about beaver, they have such an extensive range and they're already kind of at the edge of that. They're arguing that they're we don't need to focus as much as the range um, extension and more that we're going to see density um, increases um, in the interior, which um, which depending on one's perspective could be uh, quite a good thing or could be, um, if they're a nuisance to you, could be a pain. Um, so now back to this, this idea of why beaver build so many dams. We mentioned that it helps them extend their foraging range. Um, beaver are not very uh, quick or graceful out of the water. They're easy prey, but when they're in the water, they're very quick and graceful um, swimmers and they can hide from just about anything. So having um, this extended range where you're foraging and having lots of places that you can easily hide from predators is good. It's also a built-in insurance policy to, if there are floods that uh, you know might have some minor breaches or even blowouts, it's unlikely when you have as complex of a network of dams like this that you have a domino effect and they just all fail. So it's a sort of insurance policy that builds in some resilience in the system that is their their home, at least while they're working that area. And so not all their eggs are in one basket. Um, so that's certainly some lessons we can take from beaver. Um, there's uh, There's been lots of sort of articulation of the perceived um, and uh, positive impacts of, of dam building, uh, a very nice review um, by um, Brian Bird and others um, a few years back um, pointing out that beaver dams can slow snowmelt runoff, they create all sorts of, uh, of, of habitat that's, that's fantastic for a host of uh, flora and fauna. They increase the groundwater uh, recharge and ele by elevating water tables uh, with their dams. They also um, increase the complexity of these systems, um, lots more um, interesting habitat. And fundamentally what they're doing by putting these big roughness elements in the system is changing the timing, delivery, storage of, uh, of water, sediment, and nutrients. And this has lots of um, important implications. Um, 
there have been some interesting studies um, that sort of back up some of these claims. Um, this is actually a study from Europe. And what we have here, uh, there's Q in, the discharge in um, the, is the dark, bold um, hydrograph line. So we got discharge on the vertical and time on the horizontal. And then Q out on the bottom. And really what we see um, in this and in, in other studies and what's sort of conceptually argued is that uh, what uh, a bunch of beaver dams in series tend to do is knock the peaks off these um, floods and then attenuate that water and uh, spread out that flow over a longer season. Um, there's also lots of anecdotes on this, um, but almost all the quantification of this has been done at you know an individual dam complex or, or fairly small scales. And as we think about the role that this could play in helping um, buffer the impacts of climate change, um, I think we, we urgently need um, some better research and some um, more spatially extensive research to, to really look at how this plays out across different physiographic settings and over different scenarios. Um, but all the same, some things to think about um, with beaver. Uh, this is an ecosystem engineer that is extremely um, experienced, much more so than our, uh, our professional engineers um, that have been around for a couple thousand years. This one has a little longer track record. And most of the species that we spend so much of our time um, uh, focusing on in conservation efforts um, and under Endangered Species Act, uh, often cases co-evolved with this uh, engineer in play. And those species are often quite picky and they need some of the types of habitat that beaver uh, produce and maintain. Um, they're, they're not the undiscriminating uh, rodent that beaver are. The science is conceptually solid. Um, it's largely qualitative. Um, it, a, a number of folks, in, including our group, are, are trying to slowly pick away at that and, and better quantify it so we can have more confidence um, moving forward. But we certainly know enough to invoke the precautionary principle and proceed um, cautiously um, and with, with realistic expectations about where beaver may play a role. And uh, obviously the cost is, is a huge, uh, huge thing. And so I, I do think, um, I, and it's n not meant to discredit any of the efforts of, of, of conservation, but I do think a lot of our conservation efforts are often very much grounded in the past and nostalgia. And um, as we face um, these, these changes that are just so obvious, I mean, I'm based here in Utah and it's February and it should be freezing cold. And instead, you know, we're out mountain biking and it's sunny and there's a ridiculously scary uh, small amount of snowpack. And so um, things are changing and we need to um, be accepting of that and look for the battles that we could fight and win. Um, back to this Lawler paper, this is something that he articulated quite nicely in there and actually used Beaver as an example. Um, what we have on this right here is his sort of conceptual model of the sorts of actions that we may take um, depending on the severity of the uh, projected climate impact on some system or species. And then the either the value of that ecosystem service or the rarity of the species. And so in our case with Beaver, we're very interested in the ecosystem services they provide. We know they're not rare and they're quite resilient. And so um, this really puts us in this sort of high priority monitor and act soon sort of, um, sort of stage. Um, and he argued that you know ecosystem engineers um, should receive high priorities. Um, quote, even if beaver are not likely to be highly affected by climate change, it may be wise to ensure the resilience of beaver populations in some systems um, for the benefit of the system as a whole. And that is a very good principle um, that we can apply here. Um, and that systems and species that provide critical ecosystem services, again, beaver are a good example, uh, might also be in high priority as sort of a, a repeat. But that is um, uh, definitely uh, a nice articulation of uh, the rationale behind um, using a beaver. The last thing that I want to talk to you guys about today, and this will take a little, um, uh, at least 15 minutes here, is um, if with this as a backdrop, with climate change um, uh, being something that's very real and that, that we're facing, it um, providing both um, risks and threats as well as opportunities, um, and then beaver having weathered those things before and already shown their worth um, as a restoration agent, um, where are the areas where beaver might make sense? And so um, one of the things, the range maps I showed you earlier, 
one of the things that's interesting to point out is that those range maps um, were wrong. So if you see this dark gray here in the background as places where um, where beaver were uh, thought to, to be their historic range, and then there's these light gray areas in Nevada and California. Well, there's some really interesting recent studies uh, by Lehman and uh, others um, in California that have shown that um, actually their range uh, really was much greater um, than, uh, than we thought. And so when you start thinking about this story, it's a very common sense sort of story like, okay, wow, beaver have this huge range. They're incredibly resilient. They provide all these ecosystem services. There are some downsides um, too, potentially, and there's a number of reasons why in any given locality, beaver may not work. And so what I think is really important because I believe that this does have the potential, beaver do have the potential to really help us um, in this fight. Um, we need to have uh, realistic expectations and not just uh, pretend that this is going to be the answer everywhere. A lot of folks have been working on um, on mapping efforts, trying to extend, you know, for example, in that previous example, the range maps. Um, there's different ways to model things. Uh, we've developed a model that we call the Beaver Restoration Assessment Tool. Um, Mary O'Brien, um, Grand Canyon Trust, and with some funding from the Walton Family Foundation, originally funded a pilot that Wally um, and uh, uh, Martha, a couple of Jordans, and myself uh, have been working on, and then uh, that pilot turned into a project with the Division of uh, Wildlife Resources. And this, what this model um, tries to output, in a nutshell, uh, the real heart of it is a capacity model. And so this, um, so figure A here on the left, there's different colors of this stream network. And the colors correspond to the maximum dam density that we predict could be supported um, and and so red is none we don't have any in this case orange is rare maybe only as many of it as an occasional you know a dam uh, one per kilometer yellow is occasional one to four dams per kilometer green uh, frequent so five to fifteen dams per kilometer and then blue is where we're really getting into some areas that can support some very large dam complexes and colonies and we make these predictions every 250 meters and we can drive it with um, existing or historic estimates of vegetation and so this provides an upper limit. The stars represent dams. And so that capacity model sets some really nice expectations for where beaver might uh, be able to, to, to do their work um, as ecosystem engineers. We also try to model the areas where there might be uh, potential for human beaver conflict. And just because there's potential doesn't mean it's going to happen. It's just flagging up areas where you've got uh, reasonably high capacity um, in close proximity to roads, culverts, uh, etc., the sorts of things that beaver might clog up or flood or impact um, in some way that's, uh, that's undesirable. Um, and we combine these lines of evidence to then come up with some simple ecosystem management um, suggestions that sort of try to flag up where in the landscape is unsuitable for beaver, whether that's a natural limitation or an anthropogenic, versus where are the areas where we might be able to restore beaver, and those can range from quick return zones, low-hanging fruit that's just all you got to do is put them out there and they work, versus long-term restoration where, you know, like the example of incised streams, it may take a little bit more uh, of a concerted initial effort. And then the areas where there's high capacity but also high conflict, and so we, um, we can uh, pay attention to those. The way the model works is uh, we run it all from freely available national uh, data sets that um, you could run it with uh, higher resolution data, but we were very interested to have a model that would work across a huge range of environments and uh, with data that's broadly available. So we basically use land fire to look at, uh, at vegetation and the suitability of vegetation. That's really the probably the main driver, uh, suitability of woody vegetation there for dam building. And then we contrast um, stream power estimates that base flow to, you, to answer the question of whether or not they can build a dam at all. There's going to be areas like the Grand Canyon where it, yeah, even at base flows, there, there's no way they can they can build a dam. Oh, never mind here. And uh, we contrast that with um, a proxy for typical floods, the two-year stream power. And we ask the question there of whether or not the dams that they built are likely to persist or they occasionally breach or blow out or no matter what any flood it's going to blow out and we used um, these um, as well as some other um, uh, 
uh, sort of end member uh, inputs with slope and drainage area filters to come up with this capacity model. <laughs> Um, we make these predictions in 250 meter reach segments um, and so they're quite resolved at a level that can really support project planning and design. Um, and what's nice is usually the places that the model um, doesn't seem to be performing, it's getting the wrong right answer for the right reasons. I mean, if we go back to the nationally available data sets and look at the input, maybe the imagery is out of date or it's not an accurate portrayal of the vegetation that's there or the stream's just off um, in the wrong place and so it's, it's sampling the wrong location. Um, but overall, um, it's, it's making phenomenally um, good uh, predictions uh, given the sort of simplicity of the inputs. Um, over very broad scales. And so we've done this for um, the Utah Division of uh, Wildlife Resources, where uh, Utah has a beaver management plan and it explicitly recognizes the role of beaver not just as a fur bearer um, or as a nuisance, but also as a restoration agent. And so we developed this model for them for all the perennial um, streams uh, in the state to, uh, to try to, um, and then a little spill over into neighboring states, uh, to, to then resolve for them um, on the ground where, uh, where and where not uh, beaver may make sense. So I'm going to show you a couple examples of how <laughs> we can put this into play and ask and address that question of you know where should we try and fight these battles. Um, this example is from the Weber uh, Basin um, in uh, in northern Utah. Here it is uh, a basin that drains out to the Wasatch Front, which is heavily uh, populated um, up uh, here is uh, Park City um, and so we've got the the Wasatch and then uh, the Uintas come in just a little over on the side and the existing capacity model says that that the network in its current condition can support up to 23,000 dams um, we would never expect a system to be at full capacity but that's um, that's the upper end. We'd probably, in the best of situations, we see, you know, small watersheds sort of achieving somewhere between 30 and 50 percent of that capacity estimate. And that works out over this 2300 kilometers to about a uh, dam density of 10 dams per kilometer. Now if I contrast that with historic uh, beaver dam capacity for the same area, um, if I flip back and forth here, uh, and I know there may be a little lag on the webinar, but you can see that um, we've got a bunch of more red, orange, and yellow areas um, compared with historically where there was more green and blue. And really what those reflect are our land uses, um, primarily in the valley bottoms. Um, that have limited things, um, as well as uh, uh, things like um, uh, grazing, uh, et cetera, in the, in the upper areas. Um, so historically, this thing could support maybe 30,000 dams as opposed to 23,000 dams, and we're contrasting 10 dams per kilometer to a historic of 14 dams per kilometer. So this kind of pinpoints where in the landscape uh, we can see beaver. And as is mentioned, in some places, beaver are absolutely a nuisance. Um, they can cause all sorts of, 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 of trouble. Um, and our conflict uh, model attempts to try and highlight those areas where that might take place. Right now, we're running this very conservatively. Um, it could certainly be uh, relaxed a little if we have a better understanding of you know, certain municipalities, certain agencies, for example, you know, the Forest Service and some of the headwaters, what their sort of tolerances are um, and whether or not this is really a big deal but right here this this sort of uh, shows uh, really the sort of um, impact of roads in the network and how close those roads are to our streams um, and so uh, there's what we would encourage in some of these areas um, so uh, this is an example from my Callahan site, Beaver Solutions. Um, there's there's all sorts of living with beaver strategies where we can ask the question, is the problem real or is it perceived? Um, if it's a perception problem, that may be as simple as education. If it's a real problem and they are causing damage, there are a number of mitigation measures, beaver deceivers, pond levelers, uh, trying to cage trees, etc., that might work. Um, if those um, don't work or if that is undesirable, um, then live trapping and relocation becomes a very viable option. Um, this uh, this will just be a little anecdote here of maybe some unlikely partners. Um, we've been working recently uh, with a couple of municipalities, Park City, City of Logan, and uh, most recently with Walmart, uh, of all folks. And Walmart has an area that when they built their uh, store here, they had to set aside for 
riparian wetland um, conservation, and there was also some downstream mitigation work. And uh, they set this area aside, and then beaver came in and made it 10 times better and a much, much more effective uh, wetland. Uh, the city um, and Walmart had been lethally trapping the beaver for, uh, for a few years, and really finding that that was terribly ineffective. They had, uh, they would spend 300 bucks a shot, and they'd have uh, someone come out, lethally trap them. Then, you know, anywhere from a few days to a few months later, more beaver were back um, in the situation. And Walmart's uh, contention was, as long as this isn't causing flooding that's a problem for the city, why you know, why don't we just leave them? And so we worked uh, with them. This is an area you can see that they were inundating and backing up water and it actually backs all the way up uh, to the highway here. And we came up with a very simple um, adaptive beaver management plan that just um, allows them to sort of identify the triggers for where damage may be taking place and the sorts of um, living with beaver strategies that can be employed. And of course, um, if those prove unsuccessful, um, then we can always um, uh, resort to live trapping and relocation. Um, because let's not forget, in some of those headwater areas that ha have high capacities to support beaver, uh, we don't always have uh, beaver in those areas. Maybe over time they'll expand, but if we can take some of the nuisance beaver uh, that folks don't want and uh, take them to these other areas, as, as many have done, uh, some of the best examples probably up in the Methow um, and in, in the Yakima, lots of examples on the Front Range of Colorado as well. Um, and so we can take that source population, relocate them to areas where Brat might predict or where the landscape just has currently a limited population or no population, but it has a reasonable capacity to support them, take them to good areas. Uh, and there's a there's definitely things that you can do to increase uh, the likelihood that this is going to work well. Um, uh, trapping the entire family unit, the whole colony, is uh, has been shown to be really important um, for for success. Um, some uh, as up in uh, in the Yakima and the Metau actually build little starter lodges uh, for them to release them in, so they have some refugia immediately, and even sometimes starter dams. Um, and so there's there's a b number of uh, things that you can do to make this work better. There's a lot of folks that have done live trapping and relocation and haven't seen the best of results. Um, and there's a lot of reasons that could go wrong. I mean, if you only get one individual, they may you may want them there, but they get there and they want to try and find their way back or they want to go some, somewhere else. Um, they could be picked off by... Um, all sorts of predators including humans um, so th there's a lot of reasons where it could go wrong but there are some things you can do to increase your odds and when we talk about using beaver as a restoration tool i think that there's at least <coughs> six types of beaver restoration one is in areas where we already have beaver allow them to stay um, and we promote or protect them and so this is really just uh, conservation or areas where there might be conflict um, living with beaver uh, mitigation strategies uh, the second I call accidental beaver restoration. Uh, I've seen a number of projects uh, that started out as, um, let's say, slightly heavy-handed uh, river restoration projects um, with a sort of no accounting or view for um, a dynamic channel that's allowed to adjust. Instead, we try and lock it down. And we've got some nice examples where beaver have come in, and even though that wasn't the intent, the beaver see some of the structures that were built, like these J-hook structures, etc., that they think, oh, well, that's a good foundation to build a dam. And they build a dam, and they make, um, they take these sort of static restoration designs and turn them into very dynamic uh, habitats. Um, we can also transplant beaver from one area um, to, where they're a nuisance to an area where they currently are not and let them have at it. Um, the capacity has to be there to support them. Um, we may want to do that same thing, um, but it's in an area that actually doesn't have a high capacity currently. And so we might need to t undertake some riparian restoration or change in, say, our land use management to promote some riparian recovery um, and get them in there. Um, We've been working quite a lot uh, 
uh, Michael Pollack, Nick Bowes, Chris Jordan, um, and others, and I up in uh, Oregon and now here in Idaho and Utah on beaver dam analogs and there are certain environments for example in size channels where um, it needs a little bit of a push um, to uh, sort of kickstart that recovery and so we actually can build fake uh, beaver dams or put in posts that beaver come and occupy um, and the worst of these, I would say, is mimicking beaver dam impacts with BDAs and just artificially maintaining it. We could try to do this without beaver, but we'll never do as good of a job. We've noticed we can see quick geomorphic and hydrologic impacts, um, but we're never going to spend as much time on site maintaining it as these little guys. So, you know, if we take those principles and we look statewide and we sort of limit our view of these management um, sort of preliminary management recommendations that come out of BRAT, we're focusing on these quick return restoration, low hanging fruit and long term restoration. Low hanging fruit, I can just take them and relocate them there. Uh, quick return, I may need a minor change in you know my uh, sort of land management and riparian recovery, but it should work pretty easily versus the long term restoration uh, that may require something uh, a little bit more intervention like beaver dam analogs. <laughs> And so if we come back to this example on the Weber um, and look at that output, um, we uh, can then also start to think about, well, what about declining snowpack, um, especially in a place like the Weber that has an elevation distribution that a lot of the, the basin is very is going to be very prone to not supporting anywhere near the snowpack it uh, used to. And I already made a plea that we need to do a lot more on this. Uh, we're working with Brett Roper um, and some other partners of the Forest Service um, and Division of Wildlife uh, to get some funding together to start building some hydrologic models and doing some field work to um, to really address whether or not could we get enough beaver dams back on this landscape so the areas that are highlighted as restoration zones um, to actually compete with our declining snowpack um, and it's it's a fair question and uh, it's one that um, right now we've got some speculative evidence but we really need to better document if we think about that in the context of brat we clip down the drainage network to just those restoration zones it's interesting how many of them end up in the headwaters and in precisely these zones where we're going to be losing a lot of our snowpack. And if we look at the dam densities in those areas, uh, recall that the whole basin has a current dam density or capacity of about 10 dams per kilometer. And historically, the whole basin had a capacity of about 14. These areas that could be used for restoration have that same sort of upper um, dam density, which is interesting. And where could we get these guys? Well, we can identify these areas where maybe if, uh, if uh, landowners or managers are tolerant, we can promote living with beaver. But there's also a number of places, irrigation um, diversions, uh, et cetera, that we could target as uh, source populations to move up into those other areas. Um, we've done a bunch of uh, validation work um, on this. Uh, we focused on four pretty diverse watersheds. And um, I'll just draw your eye on the right here to electivity index. And if electivity index is above one, that indicates preference for um, those sorts of uh, habitats. And if it's below one, it uh, indicates avoidance. And what we see is in these predicted dam capacities, um, and so these would correspond to, on this upper end, our uh, pervasive and frequent. What we're seeing is preference, consistent preference for those higher capacity areas and um, avoidance for the low capacity areas. And then the ones that are sort of occasional um, fall in, you know, either avoidance or somewhere right around one. Um, and so we validated this, this using um, about 2,800 dams across these watersheds, um, and uh, and things are looking pretty promising. Um, if you sort of uh, zoom into a particular landscape and tell a more sort of anecdotal story, it's also encouraging. So the first thing we notice here, we're looking in Spawn Creek, uh, we've got some orange, we've got some red, and we're not seeing historic evidence or any current evidence of beaver dams in those 
um, none in rare areas, which is good. Um, we're also seeing higher densities in the places, um, so more of these stars in the places that have higher capacities. And where we have these circles, this refers to a dam complex. Um, and this particular dam complex over a distance of about half a kilometer has 18 dams. And the capacity here is, you know, somewhere in that 16 to 40 dams per kilometer. So this is uh, working out quite nicely. Um, this is a dam complex that's been in since at least the 50s, if not longer. We've got another dam complex um, up here that uh, the model is predicting high capacity. That wasn't, we weren't seeing um, any... Uh, beaver up there uh, currently, but in 2011, a complex downstream blew out, and they moved upstream precisely to the area where the model predicts um, that there should be high capacity, and they built 12 dams in less than a month um, in that one little area. So things um, make sense with the model predictions at both broader scales and at more local scales. The data we make available um, through a variety of places on our website, uh, databasin.org. Um, you can interact with it on maps. You can download KMZs. And what we're trying to do is run this for as many regions as we can. So, so far, we've run some in Idaho, Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, Nevada, Oregon. Um, New York, New Mexico, and we're just working with different groups that are interested. Um, we've got proposals to try to um, run it for the whole state of Washington and Oregon. Um, and also all the New England states. Um, and um, it's much more economical to run this at uh, broader scales. But what's nice is there's consistency in the output. Um, so it could really help, we think, planning and, uh, and management at, uh, you know, state, state levels, national levels, down on to local levels. So there's a common language. Um, just an anecdote, I mean, even when we go to a, a completely different environment uh, back east, it's been heavily glaciated. Um, a totally different uh, kettle of fish here with regards to beaver ponds and beaver dams, the Adirondacks. And we actually see uh, very, very promising um, results um, out of this. So... Uh, so that's that's exciting. If we kind of round out here with the uh, National Fish Wildlife um, Climate Adaptation Strategy, one of the goals there, conserve habitat to support healthy fish, wildlife, and plant populations and ecosystem functions in a changing climate. And so specific strategies, identify areas, um, secure appropriate conservation statuses, restore habitat. We believe that tools like BRAT um, can help um, to address um, some of those uh, strategies very specifically. Um, another goal, enhance capacity for effective management in a changing climate. Uh, we think a, a common currency is really helpful um, for being able to communicate that. And so we've been working with various federal agencies and with this committee on this climate adaptation strategy to see if this might be a tool that uh, could be useful. So um, the take homes uh, that I want you to sort of walk away with here, um, if you didn't already know, um, beaver are an undiscriminating rodent um, and an amazingly industrious ecosystem engineer. And these dam building activities that they um, uh, partake in cause a whole host of hydrologic, hydraulic, and geomorphic feedbacks that from a conservation and restoration perspective, they provide really important ecosystem services, they increase the resilience of these systems, and they may buffer um, impacts of climate change. Um, we think that more work, particularly on the hydrologic um, buffers that they may provide, needs to be done, um, but it's, uh, it's pretty um, compelling um, thus far from just anecdotes and small-scale studies. Beaver conservation and restoration could certainly be a cheap and cheerful fix in many streams and rivers, but not all. And um, and so the expectation management for where this is appropriate, where it's inappropriate, and also keeping an eye on unintended consequences like, oh, we support a bunch of beaver in an area, and maybe that promotes an invasive um, species that... Uh, that we didn't anticipate. Um, if you have an invasive species problem, you've got an invasive species problem, and uh, beaver may help or they may exacerbate that. So they won't work everywhere, but um, with tools like BRAT, we hope that um, that can provide some some uh, some better expectations. Um, I need to acknowledge a ton of folks. Um, the main partners that got me involved in this, I have no idea how just a silly geomorphologist is now 
um, known as a beaver guy, but it's really these guys' fault. Um, they dragged me out to Bridge Creek, and uh, it's just been a bunch of fun ever since. Um, and uh, countless collaborators and field crews that we've worked on on various projects, um, landowners um, that we're partnering with, um, and a bunch of agencies that have funded this work. Um, and obviously Mary um, provided the introduction, and Mary was the one who really got the brat effort um, going and, uh, and bought my pitch, apparently. So um, with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. What I'm going to do right now is look at the the questions that are here and also if you want to uh, ask a specific question um, just uh, you can raise your hand and um, virtually here and then I can unmute you and you can ask that question um, if you want to learn more on any of this stuff there's a few websites there Well, I see that, let's see here, questions show. Oh, hold on just one second. I'm trying to make this bigger on my screen so I can read. There we go. Okay. So um, we've got a question from John McCann. Um, and John, if you want me to turn this on um i can just read your question but if you want to raise your hand i can try and um, answer this um uh was there any documentation of success from the the para beaver project um yes there was it turns out there was actually a uh journal article published i think it's in uh journal of uh is it wildlife management um but uh, i've actually got a link to that up on this uh this website um, and that was published back in the 50s. Uh, so they only tracked things for uh, a few years, but it sounds like anecdotally it sort of worked. Uh, let's see here. I'm trying to see if there's any other hands popping up. I'm not seeing anybody. Um, there's a question here from Brent uh, Fenty. Um, how accurate is our current understanding of historic distribution? What do you feel is the best sorts of uh, data for potential uh, reintroduction recovery efforts. Um, the I think that in terms of the range, we've seen that the range is a little bit more extensive in terms of their historic range. Um, I think, uh, I mean, I know the calculations Michael Pollack did to come up with the, the, the number that everybody cites uh, for the historic um, estimates, and it's a, it's a glorified back of the napkin calculation. Um, if I think we're getting reasonably um, reliable sort of capacity estimates from um, from BRAT, and uh, we might be able to refine those things. They probably won't paint a dramatically different picture, but um, it would be interesting to compare those um, because it looks more specifically at the capacity of the landscape to support beaver. Um, so in terms of the best sort of data, there's some great efforts in California uh, where folks are going around and using, um, you know, examples of old um, Native American names for places uh, that hinted at beaver activity or looking for uh, paleo beaver dams and um, evidence or documentation. So those sources can be fantastic. Let's see. You guys are all so either bored or shy here because no one's raising their hand. Um, if Michael Howie, if I can find him, he's got the next question here. I might unmute you, Michael. Um, Hi. How you doing? So you can talk instead well, of me, please, <laughs> and, and ask your question here. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was wondering, based on the uh, research that you've provided, it's very clear that there are ecological benefits to having beavers in an ecosystem and they're potential role in uh, buffering climate change, but is there research on what happens to an ecosystem when the beavers are constantly uh, trapped and killed or, or effectively just removed? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if there is direct research on the, the impacts of removing um, beaver um, lethally or live or, or, or trapping from an ecosystem there may be sort of inadvertent like um, because they're doing another study um, and that context exists there um, but I'm not aware um, if anybody else on the line is we've got a, a, a big group here so if anybody else on the line is aware of anything um, 
please raise your hand. Um, that's a good... Uh, oh, wait, looks like Malcolm. Hold on a second. Uh, where is it? I'm just trying to navigate this uh, go-to thing. Apologize. Do, 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 do. Well, Mary has a, Mary has something to add. So, Mary, um, you're on. Oh, I was just going to say that um, this summer we're going back into North Creek, west of Esquanti, and I know Joe, you've been there, where 37 beaver, essentially all the beaver in the area were trapped out. And since we have photo points from the past when they were there, we're going back and retaking those photos and hopefully getting some aerial photography to see what what the consequences were of that. That's great. Um, I, I have a quick follow-up to that as well. Um, what kind of opposition have you received, particularly using your BRAT system, from those who, uh, and, and I'll just label them all as part of the fur <laughs> trade, but those who um, are directly looking to trap beavers? Um, in... Utah, uh, and Mary's been pretty involved in this, and Utah, we actually had a really positive experience with the Fur Trapper Association um, for, I think, a couple of reasons. One, um, not all states have a, a season, but Utah does have a season, and so um, there's actually a recreational opportunity and an opportunity to get paid to live trap nuisance beaver out of season. Um, and then I think that they see the sort of efforts to conserve their populations um, as long as they are still co-managed as fur bearers as a recreational um, opportunity too and so if we're doing things to improve things for the beaver population that also improves the recreation we're talking about pretty small numbers of of, of individuals um, of trappers um, out here but uh, the working with the trappers association has actually been very very positive i'm sure that there's other examples people might have um have, have elsewhere do you do you have direct experience with that no okay um so i'm going to move on here to um it looks like dick walter has his hand up um dick i've just uh, unmuted you there yes did you have a question can you hear me yep we can hear you okay so we have a uh you know, we live in a subdivision, and we have a stream there that, you know, it doesn't run all year, but we've had uh, beaver activity the last few years. And um, the neighbors have complained, you know, about the beavers eating their trees, and so they've hired trappers to come in. And actually, they did get permission and a permit from the, uh, you know, the wildlife division to do that. And um, I don't know, I'm just trying to think about, you know, these studies. I, I guess I, my thought was... Um, you know, to maybe gather some information, kind of like what you were saying, how it, um, you know, it kind of adds to the whole ecosystem for other species, because I know most in our community are, um, you know, into the wildlife and enjoy that, whereas if the beavers, you know, are eliminated, then that's, you know, going to uh, diminish that. I'm just trying to think of where we might get some ammunition, um, you know, to build a case so I can get the homeowners kind of behind it. Um, you know, we've tried to talk to these people personally, and um, it's been very ugly. I mean, almost to a, a almost, my wife almost got in a fist fight with this woman. So <laughs> very ugly. <laughs> so I'm trying to get a group. You know, I thought if I could have a little, you know, maybe get a plan. I mean, I don't know if we analyze that um, that water system there or or what, or maybe I would get the uh, people that own the water rights in that stream. I don't know. They. Um, I'm not sure where they would stand on this at this point. Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, we, uh, I, I think that I mean, this is all always always about people, right? And uh, and so um, having uh, willing you know partners is important. What we've found in dealing with um, folks in urban areas is the starting point absolutely has to be addressing. Um, and to a certain extent, sort of, you know, validating their concerns. It's, yes, this, there are some potential benefits, um, but there's also some potential downsides to having beaver and these, these impacts. And I think if that's the starting point, you, you get a lot more credibility. Um, in Park City, we had a similar situation where there's some landowners that are being flooded um, and or their basements are flooding from beaver dams. And 
we have to mitigate those impacts with putting in things like pond levelers and if and if you know if those don't work we you know we do need to prevent the sort of damage to to infrastructure so i think there's nice examples that park city example we have a report um that sort of highlights how you can kind of go through and flag up where are the the real um risks um and where are the areas that you can mitigate those risks um, et cetera, but it's a, it's a, it's a really good, good question. Does that, uh, does that address that partially? Uh, yeah, I guess, um, so could, could I do a, an assessment of that, that stream and, you know, so I'd have something to kind of present, I mean, kind of like what you, I saw what you were doing on these other programs. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think you could. Um, and, um, yeah, maybe I can, uh, point you in a couple of directions, um, maybe maybe okay. offline here. Yeah, so, that's fine. Great. Okay. Um, let's see. Does uh, I see Malcolm? Did you have a, a, another question, or is that from yes. before? Yeah. Hi there. Hi. Um, so for the places where you say that public education is the best strategy to promote coexistence with beavers, uh -huh. what education methods have you found to be most effective, and how do you go about spreading the message? That's yeah, that's good. Um, so th there's in those places where public um, outreach and education can be useful. I think there's sort of two strands to this. Um, one is the sort of preaching to the choir. Um, you know, so probably a lot of people on this call where we can, you know, the, the folks that are going to be interested in hearing about that or might come to sort of festivals and stuff are already sympathetic to the cause and they're not necessarily the ones that um, need to be reached most urgently in my opinion that i think it's really healthy and it's good and it's good to get school children out so we've got a little beaver uh statewide you know beaver monitoring app that you know they can do citizen science with and learn more about it and get engaged they talk to their parents that's all really useful but i think really targeting the folks that are most um impacted by this you know because they're they're a landowner like in the previous example that's getting flooded or um you know uh an irrigation district or, or somebody like that i think that those are probably the places we need to focus on most um uh, and and first because you know for example here in the city of Logan you know the city of Logan just had a you know blanket maintenance policy let's just get rid of all these things um that's what they've done forever um and that's not that indifferent than than other places and then when you present them with um some of this evidence and present them with solutions that may actually be economically cheaper for them uh the, most folks are fairly receptive to that we actually haven't had um too much too much trouble um along those lines so I, I think that that's you know the audience that is most uh impacted by these things um and that's not going to be like a you know a big um a festival or something that's going to be you know sit, a sit down meeting and listening to them and trying to understand their perspective um that would be my take does that that make okay. sense would you, would you use um any other communication method as well or, or do you think it has to be kind of person you know in face person to person um oh yeah there's i mean media coverage certainly doesn't hurt um anything we can put up on the um on on the web that they can stumble across is useful um probably one of the most effective things is them hearing it from someone like them you know, so it's one thing for a pencil neck academic like myself to come up and, you know, talk about this stuff. But if there's a, uh, uh, you know, if, if say we're targeting a, a, a rancher and his neighbor starts talking to him about it and he's also a rancher and he's, uh, you know, he's the one that's passing that message along, that can be far more effective. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, no worries. Good question. Um, let's see here. I think we've got all the hands, so I'm going to get back to the questions here. There's a few more. Um, let's see. Michael Howey has already left, but uh, the benefit to allowing beaver populations to grow is obvious in the research provided. Is the research on what happens when... Oh, sorry. We did, we did get that one from Michael. Um, let's see. Darren Long. Okay. Uh, Darren, let me see if you're still on here and you can ask this question. Hey, Darren, are you there? Hey. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Hi, right, Joe. Um, I, I thought this was a fantastic presentation. Thank you very much for doing this. 
um, you know, to the previous question about communicating the impacts and benefits of, of beaver restoration, uh, I was just thinking about that in, in economic terms as well, and, and you alluded to, you know, the fact that if communities understand that, that this is a, a cheaper alternative to something else that they're doing, uh, that can be effective, and then my question um, was wondering whether or not there has been any sort of systemic research on um, the impact in economic terms or ecosystem services terms of beaver restoration within a watershed. Yeah, great, great question. Um, I don't know if you're aware of the of the work that uh, Mary O'Brien um, commissioned with Mark Buckley and Econ Northwest and the Escalante, but they did attempt to. Uh, do an economic valuation of the ecosystem services and impacts. Um, there, so that study is available. We're actually working with him to sort of update those estimates based off some more, uh, well, based off the BRAT predictions um, and maybe sort of roll that into the BRAT, BRAT framework. Um, as far as um, some of the economics there on the uh, nuisance side, um, there have been some studies pr primarily um, back east, as far as I'm aware. I see Mike Callahan still on here. I'm actually going to put Mike on the spot. Um, uh, Mike, I've unmuted you here. If if you're willing, um, do you, are you aware of, of anything, or have you done anything in this area in terms of quantifying the impacts? I know a lot of your stuff you've you've promoted um, the the beaver living with beaver strategies as a more economically viable alternative, and there are a few papers on that. Um, but I wondered if you might be able to also comment. Or maybe he's not there. <laughs> it looks looks like Mike isn't there, so that was my my bad. Um, but uh, yeah, there are there are a few uh, a few papers um, out there that uh, describe this, and the, that Econ Northwest uh, study is um, probably the the most thorough um, uh, in terms of a whole look at the whole package. Does that answer your question, Darren? Okay, yes, thank you. I'll, I'll take a look at that. Great. Let's see here. Who else? Um, Doug Johnson. Uh, let's see. I'm going to see if he's he's asking an interesting question. Um, okay. So, Doug, I've just unmuted you. You've got a question here, it looks like, about carbon storage. Yeah, thanks, uh, Joe. I'm with the California Invasive Plant Council, and we're very interested in carbon storage of um, Sierra Meadows, for one. And I know there is some discussion about how much beaver were or weren't in Sierra in the Sierra based on the flashiness of streams. But curious if um, if there's much research on the carbon storage of um, of beaver ponds and whether it's in, enhances carbon storage or actually releases a bunch of methane or um, you know kind of what the balance is there. Yeah, um, in the past two years, um, you may have seen some of the articles with headlines, but there um, there's uh, there have been a few studies. Ellen Wool has done um, a study out in Colorado trying to estimate um, sort of how much carbon is locked up in these old beaver meadows um, and how much carbon storage we uh, and sequestration we are getting. And that sort of uh, that work um, is, is very well. Uh, it's very much painting the picture of oh okay this is good as a potential carbon sink but then there is some some other work um, I believe uh, uh, Sherry Westbrook um, up in Canada they've been doing some work trying to look at global um, methane um, production um, in beaver ponds and uh, and that's been more um, uh, sort of painting a picture of oh well this could be a, a, a real problem um, without without risking offending anybody um, on the line I um, uh, I don't think we're very good at understanding the carbon sequestration and carbon cycling um, story um, and I think that there's a lot of these studies um, do the sort of back of the napkin calculations to kind of get you ballpark estimates um, and they are very interesting and useful contributions, but I still feel like we lack the context to fully understand that. So the truth probably lies somewhere in between those studies and that there are, are both potential benefits and um, potential impacts, um, but it's a, um, 
it's 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 something that the methods by which we're we're making those estimates are pretty crude at this stage is that great thanks yeah let's see here um i'm moving down to okay we got this let's see um malcolm Kenton, um, let me see if you're still here. Do, 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 do. Um, so Malcolm, it looks like you had already a... got my question. Oh, I did. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to work through this list, and I'm not doing a very right. good job. I, 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 I did. I, I didn't know if you'd seen the question that I typed, so that's why I raised my hand. Oh yes, and that question looks exactly like it. Got it. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, let's see here. Um, we tried to get Mike Callahan on. I'll try him again here, see if uh, if we can hear him. Mike, are you there? It doesn't look like Mike's audio is working, so I'll just go ahead and um, he's typed in a, a, a question here. Um, his question is, do you know what the beaver relocation survival rate is in Utah? Are there any current studies in Utah looking at survival of relocated beaver? Um, that's a great question. Uh, question i do not know uh what the survival rate is um it, it's actually been a relatively small number of beavers that have been relocated in utah so even though they've got this beaver management plan um that uh sort of allows it and facilitates it it's not something that um has there's been a ton of i'm going to see if mary is still here um, Mary, you guys have been involved in a little bit. Um, we've been involved in a little bit up here in the northern region, and um, and it's too soon to say on that. Um, but Mary, are you? Do you know anything about the stuff yeah. in the southern region? Yeah, no. I and and I just made myself a note to um, check in with DWR and uh, like Mike Golden on the Forest Service to to find out what they know. I do know. Uh, a translocation up in the severe has worked really well and then there was a note about oh yay this year boreal toads which are a sensitive Utah um, species have now made uh, been found breeding in in the pond so it's it, it would be a good thing to follow up on one thing about economics that a, a person asked earlier I do know um, and I don't know if you have the paper on your website um, Joe where someone did an economic analysis of the value of co um, culvert fences versus clearing out culvert uh, beavers damming um, up culverts, and it was pretty impressive huh. uh, in terms of the payback. You you do the upfront uh, beaver fencing, uh, you know, fencing of a culvert, and it was a real high ratio of benefit. Um, compared to coming back every year and clearing it out, but there is real a real paucity of of economic studies. Yeah. It's pretty surprising because of the me the 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 capacity to measure the economic benefits, with particular ecosystem services having particular economic values in various places. In some places, it may be retention of sedimentation. Um, in another one, it may be increasing the fisheries capacity. It, in another one, it may be reduction of flooding. So it isn't a. Uh, it, it, it what we what we need, of course, is along the lines of what Mark Buckley did with Econ Northwest. He looked at all the factors he thought could be could be um, economically quantified and then said, for instance, in the Escalante River watershed, it was probably the sedimentation that drove the highest economic value there. So further work on that is important. And and I'm just getting down the list here too, Mary. Thank, thanks for that. Um, to to uh, Mike, uh, Callahan is Mike isn't working, but he did uh, add to this. Uh, there was a study for the Virginia Department of Transportation by Stephen or Stephanie uh, Boyles, um, HSUS, uh, looking at flow device economics, and it showed a savings of seven dollars for every dollar spent. In my experience, the savings are even greater. Um, so, so thanks for that, Mike. That's that's really helpful. Um, let's see here. Uh, I think that the last question in the list here is from John McCann. 
Um, it says, I'm excited about the Beaver monitoring app. Would there be any benefit to your program to advertise it for use in Nevada? Uh, U.S. Forest Service and Nevada Creeks and Communities team and some public land uh, partner groups would probably be interested in getting it out to Nevada. Um, let me just see if John is still with us here. Um, John, can are you there? Yeah, I'm not sure if I have a microphone on my computer or not. Yeah, it, uh, it sounds like you do. It's working. Um, Fantastic. Is it anything? So, uh, so I'm new with the, the Forest Service here at the supervisor's office in Sparks, Nevada, and I work with the Nevada Creeks and Communities team. And it just seems like in Nevada there's sort of a dearth of uh, beaver excitement. <laughs> and I'm interested in doing what I can to try to get the, uh, the message out that they can be a positive uh, force on the landscape. And trying to get children involved in things like this is an important part. And uh, like you said, getting their, their parents aware. So I don't know if that would be something that would be useful to you for us to try to get that out or not. Yeah, um, yeah. that would be that would be great. We we did the Beaver monitoring app with the um, let's see with Utah Water Quality Extension, who has a remit to work in the state of Utah and not elsewhere. But we that app would be easy to to use elsewhere. Um, Probably uh, the, the downside of it is it only works on iOS devices for some reasons that aren't worth going into. But I think the idea of the app is certainly worth doing. We've we've taken you know groups of you know second graders and fourth graders out, and you know one thing that they absolutely love is uh, get on a little side channel and have them attempt to try and build a dam, and it gives a, them a huge appreciation for. What, what goes into it and they get to get all muddy and their parents hate you and it's perfect. Um, but the, uh, it, it's, um, but yeah, I, I would be happy to chat with you about that. And we've been thinking we should try to make that a little bit more generic anyway and, uh, and a little less platform dependent um, so that it could be on any mobile device. Uh, but yeah, it, it's a, it's a good idea. There is um, a lot of exciting work that has been done in Nevada. I'm, I, I presume that you're, you're aware of that, but you're, you, it sounds like you're talking more about kind of getting the word out and the outreach side of things, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, does that it, it answer your question? Or we can t uh, chat more about it offline for sure. Uh, yeah, we can talk later, I suppose. Okay, great. Uh, thanks. Let's see here. I think that, oh wait, we got, it. uh, let's see, Pekka, I might be mispronouncing this. Um, it looks like we've got a question here from Pekka and then obviously folks can leave whenever they need to, uh, folks are. Um, let's see, I finish, yeah, so, uh, Pekka, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Hey, how are you? Yeah, fine, fine, thanks. <clears throat> Looks like you had a couple of questions here. Yeah, just one about the flu flooding center beaver. Let's see. So, uh, can you can you repeat that? Sorry. Yeah, that in Finland uh, we have no no beavers in Lapland, and but in Sweden there are, and and in Russian also, and they they have studied that. Uh, the fruit production might might be uh, used by bee beaver. Uh -oh. Like in northern northern Sweden, they have studied that much more. You have beavers, so they protect protecting floods. Oh, okay, interesting. Yeah, and it, it's same same kind of studies in U U.S. and because in Russia there have been over uh, 50 or 70 years ago, so that the floodings might be protected by beavers. Oh, great. Um, that's, uh, maybe I'll uh, try and email with you or something offline here and we can post some of those, um, uh, some of those studies. Um, it would be interesting so folks can have a, have a look at those. That, uh, okay. That's okay. great. Yeah. Well, <laughs> thank you very much uh, for that. Okay. Thanks. Um, I am not seeing. I think uh, I think we've gone through the list. I let's see. Is there any more hands? I can't see any. Um, so what I am gonna do is hand this over to Mary to say whatever closing 
remarks you'd like and um, and thank you all very much for the interest and your attention and assuming my little video recorder worked we'll put this podcast uh, put this up as a podcast um, shortly so um, Mary do you have anything to add no one uh, um, thank you very much Joe one other thing I will eventually send all of you a link to a video that we're just completing with Tensegrity Productions out of Walla Walla, which is a 10-minute video focusing mostly for service folks talking about the value of getting beaver back on the forest, and that may be useful for some of your um, conversations with your particular forest supervisor or um, district ranger, although we are going to be distributing um, a data stick to all of the Forest Service supervisors and district rangers in the western U.S. on that. Great. So thanks, and um, thanks for maintaining the website you have, um, Joe, and uh, we'll be, as Joe said, sending you a link so that to this podcast. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, everyone.